let's go ahead and kick things off. So I'm here with Sarah Michaelchuk. I got it right. Uh, mm -hmm. The founder and CEO of Predictable. How are you doing, Sarah? Doing well. How are awesome. you? Well, thank you for coming in from New York. Like that's, I, I, I'm always eternally grateful that people are willing <laughs> to travel to be on the podcast, which is amazing. So we were talking beforehand, everything went smooth, no hiccups in travel these yeah. days. Yeah. I just always find it surprising when I travel somewhere that is 91 degrees, but I'm in air conditioning the whole time. So I don't even notice. That. Yeah. That's the beauty. <laughs> Our air conditioners don't turn off except maybe like February is when, <laughs> right, when we turn right. them off. But I do appreciate you coming in and I'm really excited to, uh, to, to kind of tell your story, to hear about Predictable, what you guys are doing in the market. I think it's mm -hmm. very interesting and I'm excited to highlight it. But before we do that, Sarah, I'd love for folks to get to know you. So why don't you give me some of your background and share the folks like who you are, what brought you to here today, family, all that stuff. I'd love to hear it. Oh, shoot. I don't know where to start. There's, there's well, so, so much. Canada, right? Like we could Canada. start there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Born in Canada. Um, but really consider myself to be sort of a Chicagoan and a Midwesterner. Lived in, you know, six or seven places before I was six. Okay. Uh, my dad was an early computer scientist. Um, so early, on, like what, what, what time period would this have been? Early, like in the in the 80s 80, I mean, that's and early. 90s, yeah, yeah. right? Okay. And so, you know, he worked on some interesting projects when when I moved around as a kid. Like he worked on the first version of U.S. Express Mail tracking. Okay. Um, okay. We lived in L.A. in the early 90s, and he was working on uh, original GPS for the L.A. Fire Department. Um, interesting no projects kidding. like yeah. that, and so. Um, you know, I think he'd always wanted to, to move to the United States. Um, and, you know, and my mom did as well. And she had a, a big career, too, in, in Canada when, when she came over. Um, but something that they didn't know about when they came was the importance of linking health insurance to your employer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so it was just something that they hadn't really paid attention to among all the other different things. Well, was there an eye opening moment to. when they first got introduced to the U.S. healthcare system that? Uh, you know, caught them off guard or anything like that? or I think there wasn't. I mean, I think there was probably a point in my father's career where, I mean, he probably did have employer-sponsored health insurance at a certain point and at some point transitioned to being 1099 or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, and, and I would have been too young to be brought into that conversation, but I think they had a classic independent broker who got them onto, you know, a Blue Cross Blue Shield plan that probably had medical underwriting, um, you know, way before um, the ACA was in place and that was forbidden. Okay. Um, okay. So I did grow up on the predecessor to Obamacare plans, and then probably later at some point I may have been on one. Um, or actually, actually, I know that I wasn't because okay. I know that the ACA came into um, into law in 2014 when I was already working. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and so that, that sort of that background. I know you said you moved a lot. Was it moving for jobs, or you said six six cities before you were six, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was moving for for my father's different kind of consulting assignments that he was on, uh, and uh, then when I'm the oldest, and when I turned six, we said, okay, you know, stay in one place so that she can you know, we're not disrupting our children's education. I have two younger siblings. Two as younger well. siblings as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when did you guys eventually make your way to New York or was, was New York more just for your uh, career? New York is for my own career. Okay. So I grew up in Chicago from when I was six through going to undergrad. Well, I saw the Chicago uh, phone number come in and I'm yep. like, wait a second. You got to keep I, those phone numbers, I think, because it yeah, gives got, you that kind of link to your, I have you know, the same up. phone number since I was in high school and it's an 817 yep. area code, which is like Arlington, Texas. Uh, yep. And it's, I, I, I will keep that that number for the rest of my life if I can. I totally yeah, get, absolutely. Yeah. It's sort of that instant connection when you you, you talk to someone who recognizes it. <laughs> like, oh, Illinois. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, so you moved. So you were in Illinois most of your upbringing, yep. uh, right? And then you moved to uh, New York post graduation, correct? Post graduation um, to to work in investment banking and finance. Yeah. Um, I had uh, <laughs> in, in in undergrad, I majored in finance and French literature, sort of the curious combination. You said the two Fs, right? And a very, very interesting combination <laughs> because I'd imagine the peer group in both of those different uh, uh, studies would be pretty different types yeah. of people, right? Did you did you connect to both? Did you relate to both folk, uh, sets of folks or what? I did connect to both. I mean, I you know, I had a lot of friends in studying the humanities. Um, and, you know, when I was in French literature, I'd be taking classes like The Meaning of Life. And then I was, you know, thought, oh, finance, this this is all just about saving money on taxes. This is very dull in yeah, comparison. Yeah. <laughs> well, did you did you actually find it personally uh, not as interesting as as French lit? Well, I think I just didn't really understand what the big deal was, and I I think I think it's more that um, 
finance is more, once you actually start working in finance, it's probably more of an apprenticeship type role. Okay. And you get to see more of how it's used and how it impacts what happens. Well, then why did you, I guess, a curiosity, what drew, drew you to actually studying finance though? Um, I mean, I think always wanted to have something practical and um, wanted to interact with people. I think I had considered, since, you know, this is an insurance-related yeah, podcast, yeah, yeah. I think I had considered, oh, do I want to do, be an actuary? Because okay. I, had, you know, was on the math team in high school. <laughs> and I think my thought was, uh, that's maybe for someone who's a little bit more introverted and okay. want to be more, you know, want to work with numbers but be, you know, in a more people-facing field. Well, I guess, are you fluent in French? I don't consider myself fluent. I, I'm fluent in restaurant French. Okay. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Because yeah. I never lived there long enough uh, to, you know, I never lived there longer than kind of six weeks. So. Did you do yeah. a study abroad program, I presume, then? or? or? Um, I did a study abroad program, but that was in London, actually. Oh, okay. And okay. so I, and I went to London literally spring 2009, right after the market had crashed. Okay. Um, and, and that was quite an interesting time to be Well, there. that was weird. That was the conversation. I'm not sure if we'll get, capture the entirety yeah. of the conversation on the front end. But that's what we kind of were talking about as a lead in your career. You had an eight year career in investment banking. Mm -hmm. And so we were talking about that. If we, if again, if we keep some, some of that for context for folks that picked the conversation up there, but tell me how you got into that world, kind of what life was like. I mean, that's a a wildly different world than what you do today, but I'd love to hear kind of some of your experience as an insider, as an investment banker in New York. Um, that again, very broad question, but I mean, I think, uh, you know, what was interesting about it was I decided to still go into it after the market crashed and really nobody else wanted these jobs. It was it was still hard to f- get the jobs because also people weren't hiring as much. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so I joined uh, a company, a bank called RBC, the Royal Bank of Canada. So, you know, couldn't really escape those Canadian know, rooms. Nope. Um And, you know, they were interesting because they saw what was going on around the rest of Wall Street and, you know, great people were being laid off and they just said opportunistically, we're going to pick up um, some great talent. And, you know, it was almost sort of like a startup of investment banks. So while I was there, I think we tripled our market share. And it was really fun because you could try to go up against you know, the big brand names or the Goldman Sachs or the Morgan Stanley's of the world and try to win business. Um, And, you know, that was a fun time to be there and also to be on a great team where, um, you know, everyone I worked for had been, had these amazing long careers and it was just kind of fascinating. Well, was it um, what I presume kind of some of the lifestyle that that accompanies a a New York investment banking career? I mean, long hours, right? I mean, what are Uh we working 60, 70, 80 hours a week? What what was the norm? Something like that. I I mean, I I think I remember as a first year analyst, my general goal was I was like, well, this would be great if one night this week I can go home before midnight and just sort of get catch up on sleep. One night this week. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or one night each week I would try to do during during the week. And I, I feel Slacker, like I could usually right? sleep yeah, in yeah. on weekends. And um, there it was kind of funny because I remember up until my third or fourth year, it was just the norm that if you looked in my fridge, it was only bottled water. Okay. Because <laughs> you just never ate at home. You always never home. ate at the yeah. office. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> just, uh, yeah, and I, I think it was, you know, the people who learned how to have a good work-life balance would realize that it actually wasn't great if you, if you could actually leave to go eat dinner somewhere else or cook or something, that was good. You didn't want to stay for, like, the free dinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or you should maybe see your family every once in right, a while, right, right, during the week, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, does that, does that uh, kind of predispose you to, uh, there's a certain shelf life for that career. Is it, is it difficult to sustain a 30, 40 year career in investment banking and have uh, kind of that work-life balance that you were describing? Well, I think the industry is changing partly because of the talent that it can attract. Okay. Um, and I think even investment bankers would acknowledge that they're seeing talented people go into, to work in tech or to work in other industries because They can get paid in some cases just as much through Mm -hmm. equity components, um, have a better work-life balance. So it'll be interesting to see how that morphs because I've certainly seen really talented people that even made it to, you know, the managing director level that chose to go leave and do something else. And and it's interesting. Um, You know, some of the senior bankers would say it has to do with, you know, the way that pay has changed and um, post- uh, 
post the recession, you would see a lot more layoffs. And mm-hmm. so it became a much riskier career because it's one thing to work all those long hours when you're in your 20s, knowing that eventually you kind of have career stability. Yeah. But when that equation shifts and it's like, oh, but you also might get laid off at any point it probably starts to feel less worth it. Well, fair enough. And I want to circle back around to this yeah. and go into your transition <laughs> of, uh, to Predictable, which I think is a really cool story. But uh, one thing I want to, I'll want i be remiss if I don't ask you about, which I think is really interesting, is you funded a short film. Uh, <laughs> in, in, uh, was, was it in college at the time that you did no, that? No, it, oh. it was during my investment banking. Okay, career. it was. Okay, so, <laughs> so tell me about that because I saw, uh, I don't know if that came up in conversation or I, I saw that somewhere, yeah. but I'm like, that's a really interesting kind of outside the box thing. So how did that come about? This podcast is brought to you by True Captive Insurance, a premier medical stop loss captive for employer groups ranging from 25 to 1,000 employees. True Captive believes in healthcare that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated. That's why they take a white glove approach, making it easy for employer groups to transition into a program built specifically for them. Check them out at truecaptive.com. Yeah, I think it was something I always had an interest in. Again, mentioned the kind of French literature background, Mm -hmm. and I took, I think, a film noir class my senior year of college. Um, But, you know, saw that a friend was crowdsourcing funding to make a short film in hopes of making the short film and then later a feature. Uh, And I just messaged and said, hey, can I be an investor? Um, You know, because I I knew that I... uh, could bring nothing to it in terms of skills. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I Fair said, enough. hey, can I give you money? Everybody needs the money to fund <laughs> these things. Totally get it. Yeah. Um, and so super fascinating to watch. Um, you know, it was filmed in New York uh, and then got into a couple of festivals and, you know, started going to the festivals and, and realizing that it's really a job like anything else. And, um, you know, just understanding the importance of, um, a film getting attributed to a director. So the person that I had worked on this with had written, acted, and produced the film, but it was always being credited to the person that directed oh, it. Oh, really? Okay. Um, and so that was an interesting lesson. I don't know if I'll ever go back and <laughs> do anything in that Why industry Why is again. the director the one that gets most accreditation or accreditation, if you will, for, for a film? Is it? I mean, it's a good question because I think... I mean, I think it's like a company too, right? You could have a management team where you have a CEO, COO, and CFO, and every different company, those roles are a little bit different, what the person is actually doing. Um, But, you know, the director is the CEO of a film, basically. (laughs) Well, Nathaniel, should I be giving you a lot more credit on the podcast as the director of the podcast? (laughs) (laughs) But I just thought it was really cool. And, and, you know, did did anything come of the film out of curiosity? Did it it get uh, the attraction that they needed for a, a feature length or... Um, I, I think they may have gone a different direction with it. I'm sure it's floating around on the interwebs somewhere. Yeah, yeah sure, you can find it, right? <laughs> but just the, the festival thing, I think, is is kind of an well, yeah. And typically. being in New York, I imagine it's inescapable, right? You're always going to know somebody. Like I told uh-huh. you, my little sister is up there pursuing a you know theater and yeah. and, and a film career. Um, everybody's probably got to know somebody because it's either New York mm-hmm. or L.A. for the most part where you're doing those types of things. So very cool that you got a chance to do that and see yeah, how yeah. the the industry worked. Um, but I want to come back around to uh, the investment banking world and again working to the transition to predictable yeah but you told me that one of the things you were doing while you're in the investment banking world was covering insurance or you were That's right. you were the person that did a lot of the insurance analysis <laughs> which and you made it sound like is not necessarily what a lot of people wanted to do <laughs> so how did you find yourself doing that yeah so i mean i started out working in the financial institutions group uh really broadly and did a lot initially with community banks depositories um And sort of as I moved into insurance, you know, something that I think I kind of stole from a guy I used to work for is, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you think about companies and you have revenues and you have cost of goods sold. And an interesting thing about insurance companies is that you don't know what the cost of goods sold are at the time that you sell the product, uh, the claims expense. And so that always added an interesting element. And that's just sort of a nerdy thing to say about insurance companies, but the way that we would see it come into an M&A deal would be interesting. Mm -hmm. So maybe I was alluding to earlier, I was working on kind of a public bidding war, advising a a buyer on something. And um, kind of at the last minute, one of the counterparties in the deal had made a mistake in their insurance reserves and it blew up. And so that led to my client getting part of that deal. And how big was that mistake financially? Do you recall? I mean, I think it was a publicly, oh, I think it was probably 
tens of millions to maybe a hundred million, but it, but it was a publicly traded company that I think ended up blowing up. I have to go back and look. Okay, but, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it was sort Hopefully of like, oh, did. that's an interesting kind of side bankruptcy. Like, good, now yeah. we can do this. That's funny, uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's, just, yeah, it's not something I necessarily associate the two things, investment banking and insurance, but yeah. every company, right, that you're analyzing for some sort of deal has a health plan, presumably at the size and scope that you're, you're looking at. So that is going to factor into the equation. And, and mm -hmm. if you talk to any insurance broker, they're always going to tell you it's the number two or number three line item on anybody's P&L, any employer's P&L. Oh, the, the health insurance part. expense. Yeah, the health insurance right? expense. Yeah. yeah. So, so just thinking about it, right, I don't necessarily think upscale what it would look like on a deal. But right. I mean, you could, right. you, a deal could fluctuate by a, a significant amount of money based on the unpredictability of the, the insurance plans, correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, and I was actually working more with property and casualty, okay. Okay. Um, some life and annuity, but, you know, an insurance company is sort of a, a pile of cash and a bunch of promises. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's I like how many, steal that yeah, yeah, how many promises did you make? And uh, <laughs> are you going to be able to make good on those? <laughs> that's funny. And so did you did you end up embracing being that person? Uh, and did you end up finding, I, obviously you've gravitated towards it, but was there something interesting about the insurance world that you found fascinating? I mean, I think it was just that. I think it was the extra element that it added to deals. And um, also, you know, when, when you're selling a company, um, if there's really straightforward cash flows or company is EBITDA or something, you know, it's, it's, easier to set up a competitive process where yeah. a lot of people want it. Um, what's interesting is when you're selling a company that not nobody wants, but the, you know that very few people want, whether it's because they can't afford it um, or because it's kind of has a bit of hair on it. Um, and so, you know, there's different strategies there of, of how you approach, you know, running a sale process. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. And uh, you had a personal experience, and I like to kind of move into mm -hmm. the predictable uh, yeah. world now and then really hear about what, what motivated it, why you decided to do it, how you started to do it, all that stuff. But mm -hmm. didn't you have a personal experience with like a high deductible health plan or HSA that gave you some somewhat of an epiphany about how insurance yeah. works at some point? So could you share that story with the folks? Yeah, that's right. So I would, and it actually does kind of, tie into the work I was doing. So, you know, 2014 is when, not when Obamacare was passed, but when the ACA, the provisions actually went into play. And so I was working on a bunch of different deals at the time that were kind of related to that or trying to take advantage of those headwinds. Um, and so I was reading all more about high deductible plans, which of course have existed for, you know, had existed for decades before that, but were really being pushed a lot. And I said, oh, this is awesome. So, you know, when you're in your 20s, you're paying low premiums and, you know, you're putting money into this HSA that's going to grow and you still get all your preventive care for free. And, oh yeah, like I should be getting preventive care. I should, you know, <laughs> in addition to just working all the time. And, <laughs> and so, um, I drinking the Kool-Aid, I go on the plan that my company offers and I go in for my preventive care and then am hit with a $400 bill, which, you know, as I make all the phone calls to follow up, realize because the CPT code for a vitamin D test is not counted by the federal government as preventive care. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, realize that I have to pay this because it's, you know, I haven't hit my deductible, um, can't really negotiate it. And, um, you know, that was interesting to me because that was a $400 bill, which is completely fine when you work in finance. Um, but also I know that when, you know, I went to college on a scholarship and when I moved to New York, I borrowed $2,000 from my parents um, in order to move here. Okay. Um, and knowing that $400 is sort of a significant chunk of that, um, you know, just realizing for most people, that's enough money to sort of not go to the doctor. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and I had a personal experience as well where in high school I had sort of a, pro basically probably needed a root canal okay. and there was some sort of temporary thing they could do where they said, well, the root canal will cost a couple thousand dollars, but we could try this other thing. That'll, that'll be like a couple hundred dollars. It might work. And, you know, knowing at that age um, that money is a stressful mm -hmm. thing, I was just like, yeah, we'll try this. Um, and that kind of lasted me through to my senior year of college when I was in sort of like an unbearable amount of pain. But I really, I already had a job offer that I had signed. Um, and I really had been holding out to say like, wait, let me wait till I get mm -hmm. health insurance through mm -hmm. a job. 
and I couldn't wait any longer. And I fell for the exact same trap again, where I go to this dentist in the St. Louis area and they say, well, we can do this thing that might work and, you know, it might be less pain for you until you can actually get the root canal and did it again Mm. and did it again. And then I didn't end up getting the root canal done until a year into the investment banking job after I got my first bonus. So I knew I wasn't going to get fired or something. And, um, and when I did it, ultimately, you know, they said that it was one of the more complex ones they'd seen. They had to schedule extra appointments. There was was a lot of blood because it had been delayed for so long. Um, and so, you know, knowing that I did something like that, you know, it doesn't really matter if somebody like understands the math behind why it's smarter to spend the money first. Um, emotionally, it's it's not what you're going to do, especially if it's just, you know, a little bit of pain that you're going through personally. Well, yeah, and it's there's literally the financial barrier to entry. I mean, I hear all the time people talk about most people can't afford a, uh, you know, an unexpected $500 bill, right? Mm-hmm. Well, what if you know I have to spend $500 on this thing, I'm in pain, but I think I can tolerate it, or maybe there's mm-hmm. potentially uh, another alternative that's really not a, a, an, a long-term solution, but it's a partial solution that gets me through to some of right. I mean, these are all all different parts of the equation that somebody's going through in their head. And it is a very common, I would say, situation when it comes to high deductible health plans. And I think it is an unfortunate byproduct of the proliferation of those health plans because people were delaying care, pill splitting, you know, those types of things. Something we see a lot is kind of consumers will do the on off year thing where they'll say, okay, this year we're doing everything, (laughs) a family more so this year we're getting everything under the sun that we can do. Next year, we're not doing anything. Oh, and and that's not good for the system either. Yeah, absolutely. So it doesn't yeah. encourage so that You said, though, that that did kind of shape um, maybe or was a precursor to the idea of predictable. So yeah. let's, let's transition now and let's start really to talking about uh, the inception of that. So how did that how did that lead into it? And then let's actually lay out the inception of predictable. <laughs> sure. I, and again, yeah, it, it was such a kind of a slow moving thing. So, I mean, I think it planted the seed when I, when I got that kind of $400 bill, which, again, not a big deal, but realized how opaque the system was and how much research I had to do to figure out even what I had just gotten a bill for. Mm -hmm. Um, Just said, why isn't there sort of, you know, why isn't Google fixing this already? (laughs) Because my whole childhood, you know, whenever something was annoying or a process had too much paperwork, you know, a a tech company was working on it. And certainly it wasn't something I should get involved with because I'm, you know, I didn't, I wasn't a software engineer. I have um, you know, my dad, my brother, both software engineers, my sister TA'd software engineering at Carnegie Mellon. So mm. not too shabby. So I was, th- I was like, well, I'm certainly not the engineer. I'm not the one yeah. to be doing this. But you're connected. You're, you're well I'm connected. connected. Yeah. I'm connected. <laughs> <laughs> so did you think, oh, well, if, um, somebody else isn't already working on this, which were well, you presume yeah. right they were, could I do it? Like, did you have this thought? Like maybe I could solve this problem. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I was kind of watching in the background, and what was interesting, not particularly with health insurance, but we did see things like Google would announce they were going to go into maybe the auto insurance market, and then they would announce a little bit later, like, oh, we're actually not. Yeah. And, I, and my assumption was sort of, um, oh, this is probably regulatory, and they don't want to deal with all the laws in different states, or I, I didn't know exactly why, but I knew there was some kind of disconnect there. Yeah. Um, and... Um, I also did think there was some some unique insight that I had from some combination of knowing about insurance. Um, you know, I think being a woman, you start going to the doctor at a younger age. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you, you start going to the doctor when you're a teenager. Um, and then also kind of coming from this frugal upbringing yeah. where, you know, thinking about money and, and feeling stressed out about money and having that actually impact my behavior and feeling like kind of the intersection of those things was what made me kind of fit to work on this issue. Well, so then take me in from predictable being just an idea, idea yeah. to an actual <laughs> business, right? Because I know that actually it's a, it's a business you started how many years ago now? Uh, uh, um, four and a half four years ago. Four and a half ago. years ago. Okay. So yeah. like, when did it become like, I really am going to sink my teeth, uh, not to, you know, no pun yeah. intended, uh, but into this idea. This podcast is sponsored by PlanSight. PlanSight is a technology for employee benefits brokers to more efficiently manage their RFP process for any group size, all funding types, and over 20 benefit lines and point solutions. PlanSight is the only end-to-end RFP technology on the market today. Let's modernize your RFP process together. Check us out at PlanSight.com. 
Yeah, so I, I think I had told you one of our prior conversations. It was the kind of thing where I would always talk about it, you know, when, when we'd be getting drinks with coworkers after work or something. It was something I'd always end up talking about, like, oh, someday I'm going to work on this. So by the time I actually did leave, some people were like, oh, yeah, it's that thing you always talk about. So so that wasn't a surprise to them. Okay. But um, becoming an entrepreneur, leaving an investment banking career yeah. really felt – like coming out of the closet or something because it's just something nobody you didn't really see other people doing a lot of people would leave to go to private equity or um corporate jobs um so you know there was sort of a logical point where um there was a transition on our team and a, a lot of people were kind of reassessing their careers and it was a logical time to say oh what am i going to do next okay. um but actually while this was going on i was my parents uh, at the time, we're 63, and it was open enrollment, and it, their premiums for the following year were going to be forty thousand dollars, because forty thousand dollars in ladies. in sh- the Chicago area because they weren't not yet 65. Um, I remember being in a yoga class on the Upper West Side, and you know one of the wealthiest zip codes in the country, and there's this woman sitting next to me on the mat next to me saying that. She's so annoyed that she made just a slightly too much to qualify for Medicaid. And I'm just like, this is so, this is so screwed up. That, yeah. you know, and I probably didn't know anybody, you know, even among my friends, everyone had some kind of issue. Mm-hmm. And I just said, something's just not right here. Yeah. And, you know, this is actually maybe the right moment for me to work on this problem. Well, you I mean, do the math on that. If they're paying $40,000 a premium, that's about $3,500 a month or so. I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's an exorbitant amount of money to be paying for, for insurance premium. I remember my mom saying that she was like kind of avoiding checking the mail um, because it just, you know, getting that. Uh, yeah. And I think not that year, but the follow, because I didn't know enough about what I was doing yet to help them. But the following year ended up saying, okay, we can cut this down to 20000 a year Mm. just by, you know, this is a certain narrow network. And if you could just go to like a slightly narrower network and don't go to these hospitals, literally you can save like half. I mean, cut it completely in half. So $20,000 a year is not an insignificant amount of money, but to cut it by 20 grand is Mm -hmm. immensely helpful. So, all right. So walk me through when this wasn't just something you scribble on the back of a napkin over social uh, happy hours and then it (laughs) become... I'm going to leave my job and go do this. So how did that happen? It's, it's funny because I took a couple of weeks off and thinking I have no idea. I, I just want to like kind of get my head straight and figure out what to do next. And then I started working on it during the weeks off. Okay. And what was interesting is when I first started working on it, I was really obsessed with talking to consumers. Um, and I remember, well, I mean, I think, again, I think I was mentioning this to you. We started out working with people with chronic conditions because mm-hmm. they're high claimants and, you know, could see how things were working in their plans. Pretty quickly noticed um, the maternity claims and saying, whoa, what's that? What's that? hundred thousand dollar blip and that's crazy yeah what's that hundred thousand dollar <laughs> blip but by the way like i used to work in the stop loss world yeah. and uh congenital anomalies yeah um and complicated pregnancies NICUs, were always in the top probably. 10 yeah always yeah. in the top 10 of, of claims that they don't yeah with. and yeah. these were just kind of healthy routine pregnancies and what's funny is when i was starting and doing a lot of user interviews i was talking to a lot of new moms and they are very hard to schedule with. And, mm. you know, you have to plan around nap times if they're even going to want to talk to you. Mm-hmm. And I remember one day being really frustrated because I had some meeting with a venture capital firm or something, and they were being kind of dramatic and rescheduling me around. And I was like, oh, I guess I have to meet with them. And and I remember it screwed up a meeting I had with a new mom. And, I, and in retrospect, I was like, why did I talk to this VC firm? Like this is way hard to, harder to get on the calendar of this yeah. new mom. <laughs> and so, and, and then that was sort of, you know, the realization of like, okay, I can't, I, I can't really talk to investors very often. Like I, I have work to do. I have work to do. I have work to do. <laughs> I have a problem to solve. Yeah. So, so let's, what problem are we solving? What is predictable? Let's, let's define it here. Yeah. So, I mean, initially it was healthcare cost transparency. Okay. Um, and, you know, how much does it cost to go to the doctor. And that quickly morphed into, you know, you you need to have insurance education in order to do that. And the way that people with, 
you know, high claimants, people with chronic conditions, people having babies, the, the way that they keep their costs in check is by getting better insurance. And so it quickly morphed into what's the point in time when you can actually change your costs? It's at open enrollment uh -huh. when you are deciding which plan to go on, whether it's your own plan or your spouse's plan. Um, also, you know, Employer-sponsored healthcare was designed at a, you know, after World War II, at a point when people still kind of started working, were in a nuclear family, and stayed in their job until they died or retired. Yeah. And now people change jobs, and the way that people shop for health insurance is by getting a new job, getting moving in with the boyfriend or girlfriend, yeah. um, getting married. Like that is now how you get access to better health insurance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so you're, you're solving at the front end. So let's, let's talk about mm -hmm. the mechanics of what Predictabil is doing um, as software for supporting these people's decision-making process. So w define for me a little bit of what it looks like to interface with the system. What data do you need? And if I'm a consumer, what am I going to benefit from when I, when I use Predictabil? Yeah. So in, to be extremely simple, it's, purely a calculator that says, based on what you're worried about next year, what should you do right now? Okay. And so we can kind of work with as little or as much information as you give us. So you can give us all the gory details of what your plan is, or your employer could be working with us and it could already be synced. Um, but then you can also add in your spouse's plan, or if you have a job offer, um, or you know maybe you left your job and you're saying, should I go on COBRA or should I go on Obamacare in my okay. state? Okay. Uh, even even inter we had one interesting person who retired like at age 50 and was saying, which of these two states should I move to? Uh, and we were able to show side by side which state, you know, the Obamacare was better in. <laughs> no kidding, right? Yeah. Mean, that, oh God, Lord, well, and that. then it came up a lot in COVID as well when when adults were living with their parents mm -hmm. and in a different state. And they said, which state should I be in the majority of the year or which state should I see my doctors in? Really? And, and that was that was kind of interesting because I don't think they designed those plans to be used that way. <laughs> They, they probably didn't, but yeah. I mean, I can I can see why. And I mean, I was just kind of going to say that's an unfortunate testament to the cost of healthcare when mm -hmm. somebody's literally looking about which state am I going to move to mm -hmm. so that I can afford the health insurance in that state. Um, yeah, that's wild. So so talk to me about the interface of the system. So what I don't need to be super sophisticated, yeah. right, to to be able to to benefit from the solution. That's but, right. You do, you do have to be a little bit willing. You know, you either have to be willing to dig for your data up front if your company is not already synced. Okay. Okay. Um, or maybe you have to be willing to kind of pester your HR person to say, hey, send me these yeah. SBCs or how much does this plan cost or, you know, what's our fertility coverage or that kind of thing. Um, but you, what you can also do, though, is you can go in totally blind and you can say, I'm guessing this is what my deductible is and I'm guessing this. I'm going to see what it looks like. And, oh, now that I see what that could what difference that could make now let me go get the real numbers yeah, and edit okay, it, yeah. you know when you said if my data is not already synced so what would that look like if, if the data was synced and how does that work <laughs> well um you know if if we're working with an employer they can send us all their documents because you know you are a health insurance subject matter expert mm -hmm. so i bet you could fly through our onboarding process yeah. easily but what's crazy is that every individual health insurance plan that you get and most most people have on average, two to three plans offered through their employer. Okay. Each plan, there's about, you know, 50 data points just for the catastrophic coverage, let alone pharmacy and all the other things. Yeah. So the average person isn't going to want to put all those things in, but they might be interested to know, um, oh, this is what my cost will be if my family deductible is an aggregate deductible versus if it's embedded. Okay. And they could adjust that. I mean, they're probably not going to use that terminology, but you know, it's going to, it's going to, they might say background. it because they read it on a piece of paper, but they might not quite understand yeah. and aggregate and embedded. It is still something that I, yeah. you, you call me a subject <laughs> matter expert. I think maybe I've overstated my expertise on actual health insurance. It's mostly, you know, the self-funded world and the yeah. finances of self-funding, but uh, I could speak the language at least in, in yeah. healthcare. But what are some of the variables that uh, an individual might consider of, you know, how many times I go to the doctor? Am I anticipating a certain procedure? Maybe mm -hmm. you mentioned pregnancy pregnancy and fertility earlier? Like what are the things that are pr you see most impactful when someone's going through that decision-making process? Yeah. I mean, what's interesting about the kind of maternity claims process is if you are in open enrollment and you already know that you are pregnant or your spouse is pregnant and you have a due date, you know, if you do the math or if you let us do the math, like you, you can literally save, you know, $5,000 or something. Um, 
However, what people often don't realize is the fertility piece can be even more important. So if you're saying, oh, we think we're going to have a baby next year, um, you might not realize before you start trying, but there's a really high percentage of couples. I think in New York, it's something like one in every six couples, babies is born on IVF. Mm. Um, one you in might, six? In Manhattan, I think. Okay, Manhattan. <laughs> in, in Manhattan, which is just its own weird its own part level, of the world. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, But, but um, you might not realize, oh, I actually should be, you know, calculating for this fertility scenario. And there can be swings of $100,000 of what you pay out of pocket personally. Um, and this I'm sure that you also see in, in your work. Yeah, yeah, to a degree. And I remember I, I remember I was telling you over coffee, like uh, my one of my old companies, Sun Life, which is great, great company. Mm -hmm. Huge company, obviously, lots of cash, but also really rich benefit uh, program mm -hmm. as well. Probably one of the richest benefit uh, plans I've ever had. And uh, I remember fertility being a part of the the package that they were offering at the time. Don't know if it's still the case, but yeah. at the time that was the case. And I, I was 32, 33. We didn't quite, ha we didn't have a child yet. I don't know if we would... I, maybe we maybe we were uh, thinking about trying, but I remember going, oh, this fertility benefit, and not realizing what that actually meant, how, how rich of a benefit, because yeah. I think it was 100% coverage on fertility for yeah. a certain round, number of rounds. And yeah, well, now that I know some of my friends, some of the experiences they've gone through, yeah. the cost, if you have to pay for it out of pocket, can be substantial. Um, and yeah. like you said, you might have multiple rounds before you actually benefit from it as well. So each yeah. time has a big cost associated with it as well. That's right. And I don't want to kind of name names here, but you even see people posting online, especially in forums for women in tech where they're saying like, okay, I like, I literally have to get a new job because I want to have a kid. Yeah. And like, what, what's IVF coverage at this company? What is it at that company? And they're trying to figure it out before the interview because they're not going to mention it in an interview. Yeah. It's, um, not, it's not something you throw out there, by the way, what is your fertility coverage? Right. right. And, yeah. and even and if, none of their business anyways, right? Even if you know a company has unlimited IVF coverage, which there are certain ones in, in New York that even the doctors know who they are. Yeah, they're hoping you don't name their, na name their names right now. Just yeah, days. yeah, yeah. But, well, well, or they're hoping that I do, actually, because it attracts great candidates. Yeah, fair enough, yep. And so even if you know that some tech company has, like, this amazing coverage, doesn't mean you can get a job there. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, but it does make you interested in working there, probably. <laughs> yeah, well, that's fair. Yeah, and as an individual, I, I could see that being a very attractive uh, benefit, uh, for yeah. sure. But not, I don't want to belabor that too yeah, much. Yeah. Um, but I think it was interesting, right? Because you brought that up over a coffee, and I was like, that's something I didn't really consider. Yeah. Might weigh heavily on somebody's decision-making process yeah. for, for picking a plan. But uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, then, yeah. well, kind of on a related note, we often also, we see mental health comes up a lot. Uh, and what's, what's very interesting about that is people don't want to say, like, what's the therapy I'm actually doing, and how does that go through my plan? They want to see if cost wasn't a problem, how much would I go to therapy and how would that go through these potential plans I could join? Okay. Yeah. Well, and so where does the role of, uh, of predictable begin and end, right? Because we're mm -hmm. not, this not necessarily is a continual process throughout the plan year, correct? Or are there some things that you do still intervene and get involved with throughout the year? I mean, we're happy to look at something if someone is having something, especially if it's kind of a financial issue. Okay. But I mean, really we're there for education. We're there to show how the math works. Um, we're there to, if you don't have full information from your employer, we're there to explain how to ask the questions, what language you should use to ask to okay. get that. Okay. So something, a, a trend that has been going on in, in PPO plans is the mechanism for out-of-network reimbursement. And, you know, used to be kind of 80% of usual and customary costs, uh, shifting towards being a percentage of Medicare and so somebody, a consumer might think that they're getting a, P a PPO plan, they're paying extra premiums to do that, and then they realize that there's hardly any reimbursement. Uh. And they're very frustrated because they realize they might have been better off on an EPO or an HMO and just negotiating all their out-of-network care themselves because they're not getting anything back. Is that something you could capture on the front end? Yes. Okay, cool. Hey, could you explain how or maybe how that might work or... Y Without yeah. giving away the secret sauce of the, yeah, no, it's the, not a secret algorithm. at all. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, out of network deductibles, it's it's so confusing because you know you look at what you paid to the provider out of pocket, you look at what qualifies for reimbursement, then you have to accrue that towards the deductible, the out of pocket max, and then subtract that from what you paid. And some providers only charge you the difference because they're being nice, but it, it's it's like impossible to understand. Yeah. And also, it's 
you know, it's small numbers, right? It's like, oh, another $80. And it feels like a waste of time laying it all out. So we can kind of show side by side on this plan, this is what it looks like. On this plan, this is what it looks like. Um, and, and so you can say, okay, it's worth it to spring for this plan. But, you know, this other PPO plan kind of sucks. And I, I shouldn't. Well, and we, we're talking about it. I want to ask you this, could be a, just kind of a, um, a blocking and tackling question. But, like, does this work on a group? employer chassis is it mostly designed for individuals like tell me about the the mix of who your clientele actually would be we're on a mission to partner with the most innovative companies in america to fix health benefits one plan at a time navmd has created a blueprint that delivers world-class benefits to 155 million americans better benefits starts with data intelligence our platform is empowering the next generation of advisors to zero in on opportunities to optimize the plan, build the right team, implement proven strategies and solutions. Join us on our journey to revolutionize health benefits. Let NavMD put you a step ahead. I mean, it's mostly designed for um, group plans because those like most people, when they want to have good health insurance, they organize their lives around getting it, you know, whether they're they're going to an employer, whether they're, um, you know, you mentioned your sister being in theater, whether they're on, in, on the SAG, SAG plan yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or some kind of union plan, um, whether they're in med school and they're on a school plan. It's almost always a group plan. And, and what's interesting is. Um, so we've built a data model that can compare apples to apples group plans with individual plans. And, you know, the individual plans on the marketplace, they all have APIs. You can pull in all that data, but they're all very similarly structured. They're pretty, they're not very rich plans. Um, the group plans are very rich, but they often have tricks in them and, and you know, like, you know, the aggregate versus the embedded deductibles, um, there's, you know, some companies, I think this is crazy, but some companies that offer high deductible plans, if your baby is healthy, you don't have to pay the baby's deductible. Uh, you know, well, and, and it's like, what a strange that. reward, because how did, you know, you obviously didn't purposely have yeah. a C-section or need to go in the NICU. Oh, but, you know, there's little things like this mm -hmm. where um, our data model kind of incorporates all of those kind of oddball things that we've seen across tons of different plans um, or even, you know, some some group plans, they might say that if you your family deductible is one amount, if you only add children, but it's a different amount if you add children and a spouse. OK, um, stuff like this where it, it's it's really hard for even an expert to compare them apples to oh, apples. Yeah. But for the average person, they have no chance of, of you know, figuring it out. Yeah, no, and especially because <laughs> the average person, like you said, is just sees benefits one time a year for the most part, at least sees their plan design mm -hmm. options. They're not stuttery, studying the SBC side by side right. and like drawing lines. Like, you know, they don't you know see, what an SBC is. Yeah. They don't even know what it is. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. And so they're just, it's not like they're unsophisticated in, in, in the ability to understand. It's just, they don't experience these things all the time. Right? Well, what I, what I've sometimes said is our, our biggest competition is like, your uncle that's really good at this. Cause like what we see is a lot of people, they'll get the documents they have and then they'll send it to that like friend in their network yeah. who likes building spreadsheets or yeah. maybe they're that person. And so they're like making the spreadsheet on Saturday morning and like, yeah, I think I understand this. And, and they might actually, yeah, yeah. It, depend on, it depends on how simple or complex their scenario is. Well, fair enough. Well, not all of us have the really uh, a sophisticated yeah. uncle that can solve this problem right. for us. <laughs> and that's where predictable comes in. But yeah. I, I want to talk to you about, I love the, to spend a couple moments on uh, entrepreneurship in general. I, I know <laughs> you told me about the inception of this company for about a year and a half, right? You, mm -hmm. you sort of, I don't know, do you like the term bootstrapped it? But you did, right? You didn't take any funding. So talk to me about the early days of taking that leap of faith, leaving a predictable paycheck and mm -hmm. things like that, and then going out on your own. What, what was the, the early times like? Yeah, well, and I think when we talked about this before, you were asking about the funding. And I was saying, well, I mean, first of all, when I initially left, like I said, I had no tech background. Yeah. Um, I had to completely learn you know, how tech companies even got funded, um, but also like what we were even doing and, you know, figure out why what we were doing is different from what other people are doing. Okay. Um, and so my approach was like, don't go around to investors, like pitching at them, kind of wait until there's something that you actually have. Yeah. And so I think, 
I didn't pick the 18 month number. I just said I, I didn't raise any kind of friends and family money even until I had at least three people approach me and say, okay, like, when are you doing this? And then I said, oh, okay. It seems like there's sort of a brewing interest. I see. And that kind of goes back to that um, maybe investment banking background where it's like, okay, let's, you can't really set up any kind of an auction or a sale process if nobody's interested. Well, as you said, like, <laughs> wait till you're kind of being chased rather than chase the money. I yeah, think is the term yeah. you use, but that, that's from your own experience, right? You, yeah. You know what it's like to be on the other side of the table. So rather than coming to the table with an idea, yeah. you're like, I've got something that's Maybe not fully baked yet, right. but it's it's in the oven, and yeah. there's a timer counting down. And so you you thought like this is appropriate time now that I think to 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 build it to the next uh, level. I need some funding, correct? Yeah, and I, and also another thing that had happened in addition to some people coming to me was you know because we are kind of consumer directed. I think that right around when I did raise the initial money, um, we had seen kind of a our first like mini virality instance of oh, something really? happening with kind of new moms, um, which I, I don't want to go into too much. Okay. There's a little bit of intellectual property there, but I, fair um, enough. Okay. So, but, but you, you know, did, yeah, like, you popped on the radar, popped on the radar yeah. somewhere and we're like, okay, this, there's something here. So oh. yeah. Well, it's always good. And I'm, I'm uh, a three and a half, almost four years into plan site. Right. And you, yeah. you see there's a moments where there's just, outside external validation right. of what you're doing that goes that, you know, some of the, the darker days or some yeah. of the harder days you go, oh, all of that was worth it because right. now the rest of the market is seeing what we originally believed in. Yeah. Well, or it might be like, okay, well, that's working. Like, okay. Yeah, there's At least some, that still thing's working other, over that there. Yeah, working. Yeah, that, that <laughs> thing's working. Hey, just having some yeah. things work early on is, yeah. is, a, bit, is a big deal. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so when did you kind of feel like, oh, okay, this is this is real. This is a real business. I'm on to something. I can scale this. Was there, was there a moment in time? Was it gradual or did it, was there an event that you really planted your flag that like it's official now? I mean, I mean, this will sound weird, but I think what always makes me keep going is that I keep looking around and not seeing anyone else doing this. Mm -hmm. And I keep seeing everyone who's, you know, announcing huge funding rounds approaching the problem from the exact same way. Hmm. And to me, I'm just like, yeah, I mean, best of luck to them. But it, it's it's sort of like, that's, I, you know, there's still nobody that can help like my friend. Or like, I was very, um, I guess I would actually say touched when I have a friend that kind of consults in, in the digital health space who reached out to me because his mother-in-law was dealing with some cancer billing thing. And I was like, that's crazy that he knows tons of people in this space. Mm -hmm but I was the only person he could ask about this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we see that all the time with our users where there's there's like no one else, there's nothing else that exists for them. If their company isn't already paying for some kind of employer tool, or even if they are, like it, it probably doesn't help them in that level of detail or yeah. that issue they're having. Yeah, well, that, I mean, it's good. Uh, you know, I think it's always important to like have those moments where, you actually know how you impact a, a person's life, mm -hmm. right? Like you believe that you are, right? And yeah. you might see it on an aggregate scale, but an impersonal way. And then you actually see where I've touched somebody's life or I've be right. they've benefited from what I've built. Like it just, I, I'm sure it gives you that reassurance like that you're doing good in the world uh, yeah. simultaneously as well. Yeah, or knowing the situations too where you're like, I'm sorry, we can't help you. Yeah. But here's somewhere else you can go. That's also yeah. okay. Like every once in a while, I will refer people to what I uh, quote unquote, one of our competitors. Right. If, if what they're looking for is different than what we do and yeah. it's okay if they're not a fit for us, yeah. but rather than be like, ah, sorry, the solution doesn't exist. Be like, Hey, why don't you mm -hmm. talk to so-and-so? I think that might be a fit. I think that that goes around, comes around yeah. um, doing stuff like that. So let's zoom out a little bit bigger picture, right? Of predictable. As mm -hmm. you said, it's about five years into the endeavor now. Um, yeah. About that. What's your yeah. five year anniversary day? Do you, do you know the exact date? Uh, <sighs> I think it w might be February 2nd. So, Fe okay. All right. So we're, we're very close yeah. to it. So at the five year mark, kind of give me current state of the union. And then where do you see this thing going? Maybe in the next three to five years? Um, I think I would say we're really kind of wanting to get to a place where consumers can do this all by themselves without having to um, bother their HR person. Yeah. Because uh, something we realized early on is you ask somebody, oh, like, where do you work? And they like freeze up and yeah. they're like, well, why would that be relevant? Yeah. And as you and I know, that's extremely relevant. Yeah. But consumers often think, oh, I have a Cigna plan. All Cigna plans are the same. Yeah. Um, and so if we could get to a point where 
consumers can talk to us on their own terms about what they think it is and it can be accurate. Um, that would be six. And I realize that probably sounds a little bit confusing. Um, but if they could do that without having to actually, you know, ask someone in their company a question that makes them uncomfortable. I see. I feel like that would be successful. If it could truly be an experience like using Google Maps or, you know, using something that you think of as being totally agnostic to your employer and just purely a consumer thing, I think that would be success. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you look at – there's certain models where that, that that's uh, possible in insurance. I, I was mentioning Lemonade earlier. My, mm-hmm. my, my sister's husband works for Lemonade. You know, they're, they're focused on just making – and there's a lot of uh, companies out there that are doing that direct-to-consumer yeah. build your auto plan, right, or be able to yeah. pick and shop because they've distilled it down to a simple enough process where people can – can make the buying process with not a lot of information possible. Yours is a little more complex and healthcare yeah. by very nature of the system is more complex, but I don't, I don't think you won't get there. I think it is definitely possible. Well, you have to, you also have to meet consumers where they're at in terms of what they actually know. So, so, so language is, is really important and interesting. So, you know, something that I found fascinating is doctors who don't take insurance mm-hmm. A lot of times when you talk to their patients, they will not say, oh, my doctor doesn't take insurance. They'll say, my doctor only takes out of network insurance. Mm. And that's just a language thing. Yeah. And you just have to talk to the consumer that way because okay. that's how they understand it. Yeah. You know? And it's, it's things like that where, okay, that's technically right, I guess. It's, you know, it, it, Maybe not the right nomenclature, but it's technically, I guess, correct. You're exp- you are communicating to Predictable what is happening in a way that we understand what you're trying to describe, even if you're not, even if your doctor has convinced you of this, you know, which is, which is brilliant of the doctors yeah. to do. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, some, at some point you also have to layer in kind of the subjective intelligence of human nature and how we communicate and how mm-hmm. one person in a situation understands something versus another, right? It may or may not be the exact right language or may not be exactly correct, but then mm-hmm. you know, oh, well, if, if this happens, then what they mean is this, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And so you can build intelligence into the software right. to do that or the human being that's sort of triaging that and, and yeah. is listening knows what, what to do at that point. Yeah, like we had done some study at some point where we realized a huge percentage of consumers didn't know if they'd ever been on a COBRA plan before. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, just things like that yeah. where you just learn what words you can or can't use. And I think people who work in the employee benefits space um, are so immersed in, in the language yeah. of what they can talk about on a day-to-day basis. They don't realize how alien it sounds oh, it's to super, the person on oh, yeah. the street. <laughs> I mean, I, I think about it all the time, the jargon. And every one of the subcategories of insurance has its own specific jargon. Yeah. Stop loss has its own specific jargon. Yeah. And so you can't presume that anybody knows what you're talking about. Um, even if you talked about it 10 times well, on a podcast, right? You can't presume that to be the case. Even the word deductible, right, yeah. is from the insurance company's perspective. It's what the insurance company gets to deduct before they have to start paying. Yeah, yeah. That, that's true. I didn't even think about that. From It depends on who's who's asking or who's looking mm-hmm. at it, like what that the, the phrase means. So why don't we do this? Because... Uh, um, We've got, uh, I think we've got time, but we've probably been talking maybe an hour or so. I'm not, it, it, it always feels like it's less time than it is, but <laughs> yeah. I've been watching the clock. Uh, but I'd like to hear kind of closing thoughts. You know, we, we talked a little bit about future state, but, uh, you know, what do you want to leave the audience with the things to think about? I think I would like people to know that, you know, your benefits or your health insurance is, it's part of your compensation. You should always feel entitled to ask about it. You should feel entitled to compare with coworkers or not feel, you know, maybe you don't want to ask about fertility because you don't want to out that you're trying to get pregnant or something, but people shouldn't be shy about trying to get these documents. Mm -hmm. Um, Because something, something I think, part of the reason I think this problem hasn't been fixed is because health insurance is too confusing to go viral. And so if we get to a place though where people are willing to get all their information um, and ask for it and ask the question and advocate for what they need, um, then maybe we can get to a place where there is this technology solution yeah. that um, what you the information you get is so much better and you can make better decisions. Well, I would agree. It feels like you know it's a very personal thing, right? When yeah. I, I don't disagree with that at all, but there is some fear around it. Like, and there's yeah. also a fear of well, I don't understand it, and I don't want to be embarrassed if mm-hmm. I ask a dumb question, you know, or like you said, maybe I ask a question that might 
uh, hint that I'm thinking about fertility or whatever the case. But I, I would agree with you, right? It is part of what your employer is retra- attracting and retaining employees yeah. with. Yeah. It's part of that holder, the broader package. And so I would agree with you that you shouldn't be scared to ask those questions. It is important. Literally, I had a, a broker the other day that was talking about something that happened to his brother. And it was, you know, there are situations where people could get bankrupted yeah. ba- based on the decisions they make on, on a plan design or just being at one employer versus the other. What If I was down the street with somebody, my health care would have been this and I wouldn't yeah. have gone bankrupt if that was the case. Like, this is important stuff, um, wildly important stuff. And I, I know you mentioned that you have a lot of brokers in the audience. Yeah. and. Something that we see too is where consumers who want answers, who are who are using our product, um, we say, "Oh, ask this question, send it to you know your HR contact," and the HR contact might say that they don't know, especially with something like the out of network reimbursement that's not even in an SBC, and you know they have to be willing to push and say, "Oh, can you ask your broker actually?" And mm. the good brokers actually they want to help with those questions. Of course, yeah. Um, but the consumer might not know, not only do I have to do this awkward thing of asking an HR person who might be in charge of laying me off or something someday, but then I have to ask them to ask, you know, their vendor. Um, you know, and again, eventually we hope we get to a place where the questions don't need to sure, be asked because sure. more things are in the system. But those, it is your right to ask those questions. And if you are making a decision, you can get full information. You can try to create the perception that you're just that kind of like, you know, pain in the ass person. Um, Maybe it has nothing to do with the fact that you're going to do something weird with your health. You just like, you know, you're just that person that's following up for all the information. And you can be that person. Well, yeah, and it's okay if there's thousands of dollars at stake based on this mm-hmm. decision that you, you it's your right to ask that question. And I would I, mean, I would agree with you 100% there. So, Sarah, what's the best way to find Predictable, to reach out to you? Um, how, how should people go? If they're interested, where should they look? They should just go to our, our website, predictable.com. Um, that's it. That's it. That's the best place. <laughs> so, it. Predictable, it. and it's predict, just like the word is spelled, and then B-I-L-L, A-B-I-L-L, one word. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. No, no hyphens. No hyphen, no I weird. I mean, we're currently in an yeah. identity crisis with our capitalization, but... Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wasn't sure if the B was capitalized yeah, is the B or not. capitalized? Is the P capitalized? We don't know. That's all right. But there's we'll, no hyphens. We'll figure that, that, figure that part yeah. out. But uh, either way, really, really appreciate, again, your travel. I'm, I'm sincerely <laughs> grateful for that. Thank you for yeah, coming. this is a beautiful space. Telling your story. Um, I'm, I hope you're excited with the finished product. I think you will be, but I just want to say thank you for, for joining me. Yeah. Today. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. Great. True Captive believes in healthcare that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated. Check them out at truecaptive.com.